Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together to immerse ourselves in this wonderful, rich tradition that we not only receive, but we add to as well. And in terms of tradition, we are celebrating our eighth evening of Hanukkah. And uh, we'll begin by the lighting of our Hanukkah. If you have one, feel free to light yours as well. Uh, I will light the candles. We can sing the blessing. And then we will then immerse ourselves in more Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Melech HaOlam Asher Kedishanu Bemitzvotav Betsivanu Lehadliknet Eshkel Hanukkah Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Melech HaOlam Sheasanis Lavotenu Ayami Ahem Azma Aze. Our tradition says that we are to do make no use of those candles that we've just lit other than to look upon them and to reflect upon the, the miracle that they represent and the miracles that we each represent. Uh, we've lit eight candles, one past the number of the days of creation. I hope that this Hanukkah enables us to take us past what is into what possibly could be. With that, I'm so grateful for your presence. We are in our Torah portion, Arshat Miketz, which is in the book of Genesis, beginning with chapter 41, verse 1. If you'd like to unmute and recite together our blessing for the opportunity of this moment, please do so. Baruch Thank you, God, for the opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, <laughs> deeds, and relationships of Torah. I'll share with you the English translation of the first few verses in our Torah portion. I'll offer others the opportunity to read as well. Then I'll share with you a focused study about our Torah portion, and then we'll open it up for our collaborative conversation about it. Book of Genesis, chapter 41, verse 1. After two years' time, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. When out of the Nile, there came up seven cows, handsome and sturdy, and they grazed in reed grass. But presently, seven other cows came up from the Nile close behind them, ugly and gaunt and stood beside the cows on the bank of the Nile, and the ugly, gaunt cows ate up the seven handsome, sturdy cows. And Pharaoh awoke. Anna, would you like to read? Thank you. And <laughs> Sherry, would you like to read starting at verse 5? Thank you. Um, he fell asleep and dreamed a second time, 
Seven ears of grain, solid and healthy, grew on a single stalk, but close behind them sprouted seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven solid and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke. It was a dream. Next morning, his spirit was agitated, and he sent for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but none could interpret them for Pharaoh. The chief cup bearer then spoke up and said to Pharaoh, I must make mention the day of my offenses. Once Pharaoh was angry with his servants and placed me in custody in the house of the chief steward, together with the chief baker. We had dreams the same night, and he and I, uh, each of us, a dream with the meaning of its own. A Hebrew, and when we told, a Hebrew youth was there with us, the servant of the chief steward. And when we told him our dreams, he interpreted them uh, for us, telling each of the meaning of his dream. And as he interpreted for us, so it came to pass. I was restored to my post, and the other was impaled. Thank you. Thank June, you. would you like to read starting at verse 14? Thank you, Rabbi. Thereupon, Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was rushed from the dungeon. He had his hair cut and changed his clothes, and he appeared before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. Now I have heard it said of you that for you to hear a dream is to tell its meaning. Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, not I, God will see to Pharaoh's welfare. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, and out of the Nile came up seven sturdy and well-formed cows and grazed in the reed grass. Presently there followed them seven other cows, scrawny, ill-formed, and emaciated. Never had I seen their likes for ugliness in all the land of Egypt, and the seven lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven cows the sturdy ones. But when they had consumed them, one could not tell that they had consumed them, for they looked just as bad as before. And I awoke. In my other dream, I saw seven ears of grain, full and healthy, growing on a single stalk. But right behind them sprouted seven ears, shriveled, thin, and scorched by the east wind and the thin ears swallowed the seven healthy ears. I have told my magicians, but none has had an explanation for me. Thank you. And Karen, would you like to continue there at verse 25? Thank you, Rabbi. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows are seven years, and the seven healthy ears are seven years. It is the same dream. The seven lean and ugly cows that followed are seven years and are also the seven empty ears scorched by the land, by the east wind, and they are seven years of famine. It is just as I have told Pharaoh, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Immediately ahead are seven years of great abundance in all the land of Egypt. After them will come seven years of famine, and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. As the land is ravaged by famine, no trace of the abundance will be left in the land because of the famine thereafter, for it will be very severe. As for Pharaoh having done the same dream twice, it means that the matter has been determined by God and that God will soon carry it out. Thank you, Karen. And Jim, would you like to continue there, verse 33? Thank you, Rabbi. Accordingly, let Pharaoh find a man of discernment and wisdom and set him over the land of Egypt. And let Pharaoh take steps to appoint overseers over the land 
and organize the land of Egypt in the seven years of plenty. Let all the food of these good years that are coming be gathered, and let the grain be collected under Pharaoh's authority as food to be stored in the cities. Let that food be reserved for the land for the seven years of famine, which will come upon the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish in the famine. The plan pleased Pharaoh and all his courtiers. And Pharaoh said to his courtiers, could we find another like him, a man in whom is the spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all of this known to you, there is none so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my court, and by your command shall all my people be directed. Only with respect to the throne shall I be superior to you. Pharaoh further said to Joseph, See, I put you in charge of all the land of Egypt. And removing his signet ring from his hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand. And he had him dressed in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. He had him ride in the chariot of his second in command. And they cried before him, Abrek. Thus he placed him over all the land of Egypt. Thank you, Jim. Mark Thompson, would you like to continue there, verse 44? Thank you, Rabbi. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, yet without you, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh then gave Joseph the name Zephaneth Panea, and he gave him for a wife, Asaneth, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Thus, Joseph emerged in charge of the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Leaving Pharaoh's presence, Joseph traveled through all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, the land produced in abundance, and he gathered all the grain of the seven years that the land of Egypt was enjoying and stored the grain in the cities. He put in each city the grain of the fields around it. So Joseph collected produce in very large quantity, like the sands of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Before the years of famine came, Joseph became the father of two sons, whom Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, meaning God has made me forget completely my hardship and my parental home. And the second he named Ephraim, meaning God has made me fertile in the land of my affliction. The seven years of abundance that the land of Egypt enjoyed came to an end. And the seven years of famine set in, just as Joseph had foretold. There was famine in all lands, but throughout the land of Egypt, there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt felt the hunger, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he tells you, you shall do. Accordingly, when the famine became severe in the land of Egypt, Joseph laid open all that was within and rationed out grain to the Egyptians. The famine, however, spread over the whole world. So all the world came to Joseph in Egypt to procure rations, for the famine had become severe throughout the world. Thank you so much. Marty, would you like to continue at the start of chapter 42? Thank you, Rabbi. When Jacob saw that there were food rations to be had in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at one another? Now I hear, he went on, that there are rations to be had in Egypt. Go down and procure rations for us there that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to get grain rations in Egypt. For, jo jo for jo Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers since he feared that he might meet with disaster. Thus the sons of Israel were among those who came to procure rations for the famine extended to the land of Canaan. Now, Joseph was the vizier of the land. It was he who dispensed rations to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed low to him with their faces to the ground. 
When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he acted like a stranger towards them and spoke harshly to them. He asked them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to procure food. For though Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Recalling the dreams that he had dreamed about them, Joseph said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the land in its nakedness. But they said to him, no, my Lord, truly your servants have come to procure food. We are all of us sons of the same man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. And he said to them, no, you have come to see the land in its nakedness. And they replied, we, your servants, were 12 brothers, sons of a certain man in the land of Canaan. The youngest, however, is now with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, it is just as I have told you, you are spies. By this, you shall be put to the test. Unless your youngest brother comes here by Pharaoh, you shall not depart from this place. Let one of you go and bring your brother while the rest of you remain confined, that your words may be put to the test whether there is truth in them. Else by Pharaoh, you are nothing but spies. And he confined them in the guardhouse for three days. Thank you so much. And Robert, would you like to continue there at verse 18? Yes, thank you. Uh, let's see. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them saying, spake I not unto you saying, do not sin against the child and ye would not hear. Therefore behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he, and he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. And they laded their asses with the corn and departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he espied his money, for behold, it was in his sack's mouth. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, what is this that God hath done unto us? Thank you so and much, Robert. And Catherine, would you like to continue there at uh, verse 29? And before you begin to read, I just want to acknowledge, I know that your your sweet dog, who was such a companion to you, Bruni, for so many years, uh, died yesterday. And, mm -hmm. and we grieve with you. And we know what a lovely, sweet companion he was for he you. He was a sweet dog. Yeah. So thank, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. Yeah, so this is verse 27. 29. 29. Okay. Um, when, when they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they, they told him, all that had befallen them, saying, the man who is Lord of the land sp spoke harshly to us, and he accused us of spying on the land. We said to him, 
we are honest men and we have never been spies. There were 12 of us brothers, sons by the same father, but one is no more. And the youngest is now with our father in the land of Canaan. But the man who is Lord of the land said to us, by this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave, leave one of your brothers with me and take something for your starving households and be off and bring your youngest brother to me so that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. I will then restore your brother to you and you will be free to move about in the land. As they were emptying their sacks, there in the land, in, in each of one sack was his money bag. When they and their father saw their money bags, they were dismayed. Their father Jacob said to them, it is always me that you be you bereave. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take away Benjamin. These things always happen to me. Then Reuben said to his father, you may kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my care, and I will return him to you. But he said, my son must not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he alone is left. If he meets with disaster on the journey, you are taking, you you will send me my white head down to Shoal in grief. Thank you, Catherine. And David, would you like to continue at the start of chapter 43? But the famine in the land was severe. And when they had eaten up the rations, which they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go again and procure some food for us. But Judah said to him, the man warned us, do not let me see your faces unless your brother is with you. If you will let our brother go with us, we will go down and procure food for you. But if uh, you will not let him go, we will not go down. For the man said to us, do not let me see your faces unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, why did you serve me so ill as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, but the man kept asking about us and our family saying, is your father still living? Have you another brother? <laughs> Answered him accordingly. How are we to know that he would say, bring your brother here? Then Judah said to his father Israel, send the boys in my care and let us be on our way that we may live and not die and you and we and our children. I myself would be surety for him that you may hold me responsible. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, I shall stand guilty before you forever. For uh, we could have been there and back twice if we had not dawdled. Thank you, David. And Rose, would you like to continue there at verse 11? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Um, then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, do this. Take some of the choice products of the land in your baggage and carry them down as gifts for the man. Some balm and some honey, gum, laudanum, pistachio nuts, and almonds. And take with you double the money, carrying back with you the money that was replaced in the mouths of your bags. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother, too, and go back at once to the man. May El Shaddai dispose the man to mercy toward you, that he may release to you your brother as well as Benjamin. As for me, if I am to be bereaved, I shall be bereaved. So the agents took that gift, and they took them double the money as well as Benjamin. They made their way to Egypt, where they presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them. He said to his house steward, take these men into the house, slaughter and prepare an animal, 
for these men will dine with me at noon. The men did as Joseph said, and he brought the men into Joseph's house. But the men were frightened at being brought into Joseph's house. It must be, they thought, because of the money we placed in our bags, the first time that we have been brought inside as a pretext to attack us and seize us as slaves with our pack animals. So they went up to Joseph's house, doing and spoke to him at the entrance of the house. If you please, my Lord, they said, we came down once uh, before to procure food. But when we arrived at the night encampment and opened our bags, there was each one's money in the mouth of his bags, our money in full, so we had brought it back with us. And we had brought down with us other money to procure food. We do not know who put the money in our bags. He replied, all is well with you. Do not be afraid. Your God, the God of your father's house, must have put treasure in your bags for you. I got your payment and you brought out Simeon to them. Thank you so much, Ruth. And Justin, would you like uh, to continue with verse uh, 24? Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> then the man brought the men, the brothers, into Joseph's house. And he gave them water, and they washed their feet. And he gave them fodder to their donkeys. And they prepared the gift till Joseph would come at lunchtime, for they heard that there they would eat bread. Joseph came home, and they brought him the gift that was in their hands into the house. And they prostrated themselves to him, to the ground. He inquired after their welfare, and he said to them, Is your elderly father, whom you mentioned well, is he alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well, and he is still alive. And they bowed and prostrated themselves. And he lifted his eyes. And saw Benjamin, his brother, the son of his mother. And he said, Is this your little brother whom you told me about? And he said, May God favor you, my son. And Joseph hastened, for his mercy was stirred toward his brother, and he wanted to weep. So he went into the room and wept there. And he washed his face and came out, and he restrained himself, and he said, Serve the food. And they set for him separately, and for him separately, set for him separately, and for them separately, and for the Egyptians who ate with him, with him separately, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, because it is an abomination to the Egyptians. They sat before him, the firstborn according to his age, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at each other in astonishment. And he had portions brought to them from before him. And Benjamin's portion was five times as large as the portions of any of them. And they drank and became intoxicated with him. Thank you, Justin. Good evening, Norman. We are now on the beginning of chapter 44. Would you care to read a little bit at the very start of chapter 44? To continue, you... Uh, Norman. Uh, okay, let, let me go ahead then and continue it. We're now at the beginning of chapter 44. Then he instructed his house steward as follows. Fill the men's bag with food, as much as they can carry and put each one's money in the mouth of his bag. Put my silver goblet in the mouth of the bag of the youngest one, together with his money for the rations. And he did as Joseph told him. With the first light of the morning, the men were sent off with their pack animals. They had just left the city and not gone far when Joseph said to his steward, Up, go after the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, Why did you repay good with evil? It is the very one from which my master drinks and which he uses for divination. It was a wicked thing for you to do. He overtook them and spoke those words to them. And they said to him, Why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything of the kind. 
Here we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money that we found in the mouths of our bags. How then could we have stolen any silver or gold from your master's house? Whichever of your servants it is found with shall die. The rest of us, moreover, shall become slaves to my Lord. He replied, Although what you are proposing is right, only the one with whom it is found shall be my slave, but the rest of you shall go free. So each one hastened to lower his bag to the ground, and each one opened his bag. He searched, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the goblet turned up in Benjamin's bag. At this they rent their clothes. Each reloaded his pack animal, and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers re-entered the house of Joseph, who was still there, they threw themselves on the ground before him. Joseph said to them, what is this deed that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me practices divination? Judah replied, What can we say to my Lord? How can we plead? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered the crime of your servants. Here we are then, slaves of my Lord. The rest of us, as much as he in whose possession the goblet was found. But he replied, Far be it for me to act thus. Only he in whose possession the goblet was found shall be my slave. The rest of you go back in peace to your father. And that's our Torah portion for the week. If you have a copy of the study sheet, I invite you to, to take it out at this point. And I'd like to share with you a bit of focus study about it. Uh, and this week I've uh, entitled our study session together, Revival of Imagination. So I'd like to begin our, our, our focus study with a poem, and then I'll end with a poem. And the poem that I'd like to begin with are some verses from a poem by Wallace Stevens called The Plain Sense of Things. And this is how Wallace Stevens opens his poem. After the leaves have fallen, we return to a plain sense of things. It is as if we had come to the end of imagination, inanimate in an inert savoir. Here, Wallace Stevens is picturing a certain time of the year, the end of fall when all the leaves have fallen off the trees. And as a consequence, he imagines a setting where color seems to have now vanished, where the layers uh, have now dropped to the ground, where nature itself seems to be more denuded, if you will, absence of any texture or dimension. And he associates that season and that visual description with what he calls the plain sense of things. The plain sense of things he now associates with the end of imagination. So the end of imagination, the absence of texture and color and layers is all part of this end of imagination, the plain sense of things. So what might it take to revive some imagination, to revive texture and dimension and color in one's life. Well, we're going to explore that a little bit in the context uh, of our Torah portion. And it seems, according to some of the commentary that we're going to dig into, that Jacob, the dreamer, is able to revive some degree of imagination, to revive some layering and, and texture and possibilities, uh, as, we were going to, as we'll see as we go through our uh, study sheet here. So I turn to the opening verse of our Torah portion, which is number two, and the opening words, Vayehi mi kech shanatayim yamim. So the key phrase here is mi kech, which is what gives us the name of our Torah portion. And mi kech can be translated in a variety of ways. Uh, it can be translated as at the end of two years, or perhaps after two years' time, or perhaps from two years. So each one of those 
has a different flavor to it, a different nuance to it. At the end of two years, the sense there is we come to an, a, an ending point, a stopping. Uh, after two years' time is a, a kind of tease to think about well, what happened during the previous two years. And then the phrase from two years is a, a sense, a, a desire to now look forward. So we're going to see how it is that Jacob takes these different nuances and ways of reading this, this phrase, Miketz, uh, and see what he comes up with. And I have here also in number two, uh, the different uh, renderings for our word uh, Kates. So we have the verb uh, katsat, which means to cut off. And from that, we get uh, the word Kates, which means end or cessation. And then we also have the word katsa, which means to cut off. And then also we get katse, which is an extremity or a border, or katsu, a boundary. So when you take these different uh, possibilities from, from this Hebrew word, are we looking at something that is a blockage, a cessation, an, a stoppage, or a starting point? And that is indeed how... Uh, Jacob is going to explore it. So Jacob, as you know, is our both our dreamer and he's also a schemer. And he is also someone who has struggled into a new self. Uh, and he has also succumbed to an old self just within the last two couple of Torah portions. So Jacob is someone who expresses uh, the duality, or if you will, the dialectic of this nuance that we're exploring. Is something coming to an end? Is something going backwards or something going forwards? If you turn over, this is what uh, is re what Jacob uh, enunciates in chapter 42. It says, Jacob saw that, 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 that there was shever in Egypt. Now the word shever uh, which comes from the Hebrew verb meaning to break up, gives us the notion of horn, something that's been broken, uh, grain, something that's been that has been broken into pieces. But those same three characters, uh, depending upon where one places a dot over that first letter, is either enunciated as shever, meaning to break something or sever, meaning uh, hope. So when you look in the Torah scroll itself, there is no dot. So one has to, one has to add the dot, if you will. One has to make a decision. Shall I pronounce this shever or sever? And the Torah now allows us to say, well, perhaps it's one and the same. Perhaps it's fungible, if you will. And that is what, in a sense, our Midrash, that's included here in number three, uh, does. The Midrash goes on. There was shever in Egypt, that is, there was brokenness, uh, and there was sever, that is, there was hopefulness, there was plenty. There was shever because Joseph been, had been taken down to Egypt. There was sever for Joseph had become the ruler. So the Midrash is playing uh, on what the Torah scroll gives us, which is the option to either read it as shever or sever, or perhaps to read them as both at the same time. And the Midrash is hinting that uh, Jacob becomes aware of the simultaneity of both brokenness and possibility, and that he sees that where one lies, the other lies as well. So I'd like to take a step back from looking at the text uh, to now look at the painting that's on the front side. Uh, the painting is by uh, Aaron Douglas called The Judgment Day. And uh, he, he, he first did this as part of a, uh, as an illustration for a book um, that was written by James Weldon Johnson. James Weldon Johnson was uh, many things. He was a he was a diplomat, a lawyer, 
a poet, a composer, uh, and uh, he was also for 10 years from about 1920 to 1930, he was the head of the NAACP. And in the uh, post-World War I period was a period of, of great dislocation and fracture and systemic shock, if you will, throughout the world that 40 million people had either been uh, killed or injured uh, as in the course of uh, the war. And as a result, culturally, what happened, particularly within the United States and, and Europe, was uh, an elevation of, of kind of trauma, uh, a culture that led to uh, some cynicism, suspicion of authority, uh, a willingness to engage in indulgences of all kinds, uh, and a sense of uh, some degree of wandering. And some of the great novels that, for example, uh, Ernest Hemingway and, and others wrote at the time are filled with pages of uh, especially young men who are kind of wandering, looking, a sense of being lost, experimenting, uh, dislocated. And on the other hand, in the United States during the same period, there was particularly within the African-American community, within the black community in the United States, kind of a new sense of hope, a new sense of possibilities in part because of these dislocations that were happening. About 380,000 black Americans so were part of the US military during World War I. Many were deployed across uh, overseas. They experienced a different world. They experienced different possibilities of what life might be like. There was the great migration from the segregated South up to the North, opening up a whole new set of possibilities and, and, and a way of life. And all of those social relocations and social new experiences for Black Americans were nurtured by a cultural revival that took place particularly within Harlem in New York City. And that was, became known as the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, you had uh, great writers and poets and musicians and composers who, who really gave a proud presence and voice uh, to an ascendant community. And one of those uh, who was kind of captured all of that by being both a lawyer, a political activist, a poet, a writer, and a composer, uh, James Weldon Johnson, uh, wrote a, a book in 1927 called God's Trumpets. And it was a series of uh, seven sermon poems, and each one of those was accompanied by a painting done by Aaron Douglas. And so the one that's on our front page of our study sheet the Judgment Day by Aaron uh, Douglas uh, was associated with one of those seven poem uh, sermons called The Judgment Day. And here you've got this illustration of the Archangel Gabriel kind of striding across uh, mountaintops, a huge figure uh, blowing the trumpet, announcing the arrival of revelation, the, the arrival of liberation, the arrival of, of a new life of some kind. And you see these figures who are all uh, in various poses of praise and, and dance and getting up and uh, celebrating and the, the different uh, geometric patterns that are occurring there, the, the arc, the wave, the zigzag, all creating a, a sense of dynamism and motion. And here is the part of the poem that was uh, accompanied uh, this painting. And Gabriel is going to ask him, Lord, how long must I blow it? And God's are going to tell him, Gabriel, blow it calm and easy. Then putting one foot on the mountaintop and the other in the middle of the sea, Gabriel is going to stand and blow his horn to wake the living nations. And so in this study sheet, we start with a poem that and that begins to reflect on what happens 
when all we have is the mere plain sense of things, that with everything begins to lose its color, everything begins to lose its texture and layer, that represents the loss of imagination. And inanimate in an inert savoir that the person, him or herself, has become still and almost dead, waiting for new life to return. In, and here, at, in this poem, we have this celebration of, of an awakening, an awakening that's happening not because of uh, so much great success, it's happening as a result of emerging out of a fissure, if you will, out of a crisis that has happened uh, worldwide. And, and this is, in a sense, what is happening here in our Torah portion. Jacob is experiencing a fissure both within the world at large, the famine that's happening. He is also still living with the fissure in his family. What he, what he had been told was the death of his son. And the Midrash is imagining that somehow within that, this Jacob, our dreamer, who has retained this rather powerful capacity to imagine new possibilities, at this moment, this crisis kind of spurs forth, animates that aspect of uh, imagination, new life, new possibilities, and hope. And that begins the revival of imagination, something that each one of us ha has the capacity uh, to animate. And with that, I would love to hear what you experienced and what you saw in the course of, uh, of our time together and reading our portion. If you'd raise your hand, I'd love to call upon you. Rose, please share with us. First, I have to <laughs> too quick on the draw. Um, very interesting what you were saying, Rabbi. Um, I'd like to look at the role of dreams and what role dreams played in the ancient world versus now. Um, and, you know, the whole thing with divination, with the cups, that was that was a thing at that time, you know, looking into a glass of water or wine and, you know, predicting the future. Uh, but in the ancient world, um, dreams were thought to have predictive abilities. In other words, that you could tell the future, which is what, you know, happens um, throughout the Torah, not just with, with uh, Yosef, but, you know, that you dream a dream and then, you know, something happens, the dreams of the, uh, particularly the dreams of the prophets, you know, who see like the valley of the dead bones, you know, all those things, it's a predictive thing. Whereas now another great Jew, Sigmund Freud talked about dreams in terms of being win windows to the subconscious and our subconscious fears and motivations and desires. So it's very interesting to me. I don't know if I mentioned this that I learned in this um, arena, but when I went to Turkey, um, one of the places we visited, and I don't remember the name of it, but it was a city um, that um, was dedicated to, it was kind of like the Mayo Clinic of Turkey at that time. And, you know, very uh, wealthy or influential people went to the center of healing and they stayed in dormitories and, you know, had their beds in dormitories. And when the doctors or the healers, or the priests made their rounds in the morning, the first thing that they would ask the patients was tell us your dreams. Mm -hmm. So, I find, you know, the whole thing about dreams very interesting and, you know, how this, this impacts how the characters in the story proceed. Mm. 
Thank you, Rose. And uh, you got me to thinking and remembering that, you know, in the Talmud, there's quite a bit about dreams and the, and the rabbis are, seem to be quite intent that it's very important to pay attention to one's dreams and, and to explore them for, for what messages they, they may be conferring. And, and uh, so thank you very much for kind of contextualizing uh, that the rich body and uh, that we have within cross cultures about dreams. Let me invite Robert and then Catherine, please Robert. Thank you again for a lovely evening, and I always appreciate the use of uh, art, not just uh, the painting, but poetry and, uh, you know, the, the way you weave things together. You know, I think what struck me uh, so much was the, the, the um, contest between the material and the spiritual mm. in this part. So we have the Egyptians... The magicians, they aren't spiritual, they're pagans. It's material. They're not able to see the dream. So what does that mean? It means that they're crippled spiritually, which paganism is. Then we see that Joseph, single, alone, because he's spiritual, is able to understand the dream. So now in the realm of spiritual understanding, we see Joseph is on top. Now we also see a just king, Pharaoh. And he has given to Joseph rule of the land with the exception of himself. And again, we see in this case, the first case, it was uh, a contest, if you will, of uh, the magicians and Joseph, although it really wasn't a contest, but uh, contrast, contrast. But in the case of Pharaoh, it was by intent. And once again, we see the material acknowledging the spiritual because the Pharaoh didn't know how to solve the problem. He did not have the capacity amongst his palace and so forth. But again, Joseph. So again, it shows the pagan, the material, and the spiritual, and the necessity for spirituality to be the ultimate, uh, the, 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 the ultimate source that we go to for justice, for understanding, for success, etc. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that contrast is just so, so interesting. Oh, Robert, thank you so much. Here, what you got me to think about was how Joseph uh, starts out, as, you, as we remember, in the home of Potiphar, where he's given uh, supreme authority over that single household, and he enriches that household. And then he rises in, to take that same talent to the national or perhaps even global level uh, to, to uh, run the entire uh, country and and to uh, enable people to to survive and and uh, I'm thinking about his father Jacob, who uh, like Joseph has this capacity to dream, uh, but also in addition has this capacity to enrich materially because that's what he did at in his uh, in Laban's uh, home. He, he expanded Laban's flocks. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating, as you mentioned, the way there's this interplay of the material and the spiritual, and that Jacob and Joseph both seem to have these skills and talents and traits to be able to go perhaps back and forth between these two dimensions or weave them together in, in some kind of way, rather than merely being uh, overdeveloped on, on one end or the other. So th thank you so much for, for bringing that material in. Thank you. Uh, let me call on Catherine, and then I'll call Steve here. Go ahead, Catherine. Please share with us. Catherine, if you're able to unmute and share with us, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and ask Steve. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, the Reverend Martin Luther King, in right. modern times, said, I have a dream. Sorry. As far as I know, he's the only person in modern times that ever used 
the dream analogy on what he is. Yeah. Are, are there others that have you said I'm not aware. Well, I, it certainly jumped out at me as we were reading the Hebrew, as we read that, uh, where he says, I have had this dream, that uh, that phrase from um, Martin Luther King from his uh, March in Washington in 1963 yes. had to use that phrase, I have a dream. And then, of course, all of the uh, biblical texts that he incorporated in that speech were all from uh, the Jewish Bible. So that's, that's quite quite telling. Thank you. Let me call, go ahead, Catherine. Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Um, I'm looking at the painting and I'm sort of seeing uh, two different scenarios uh, in reaction to the uh, blood. The Yeah, Catherine, we're having a little bit of maybe some technical problems. I'd love to hear what you're saying. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, with the exception of the figure on the right, which seems to be greeting... Okay, Catherine, we're having some technical problems uh, with your audio. So let me let me just go okay. ahead. Yeah, let me just go ahead okay. to Marty, please. Go ahead, Marty. Thank you. Let me discuss an aspect of the partial that no one has talked about, which is um, Joseph's relationship with his brothers and and how he acts to them and what it represents. Um, his brothers um, sold him into slavery, and and it could have resulted in his death. Uh, and Joseph undoubtedly had feelings about that. But paradoxically, their act actually resulted in Joseph becoming a very prominent person and having the power to protect and defend his family. So it turned out it was inadvertently or maybe unintentionally a, a wonderful thing and maybe God inspired. So. Joseph initially, when he meets his brothers, first of all, he is completely the upper hand. He's powerful, he's wealthy, he has terrific authority, and his brothers have uh, are at his mercy, and he plays with them. And uh, instead of acknowledging who he is, he, he keeps all the knowledge to himself, and um, he puts them really under his thumb where he can do anything he wants with them because of the money that's put in their bags and later with the silver cup. Um, and they obviously go in with honorable intent and he really makes them feel like their life may be in danger. They may be enslaved because of what's happened. And I think that's some manifestation of his anger about how he's treated by his brothers. Of course, he eventually relents um, but initially, there's a terrific amount of anger expressed, and it's it's interesting how that plays out. So I, that's the that's the part of it that that really struck me as being something uh, of note. Uh, thank you, Mary. And it's, yes, it is fascinating to explore this relationship between Joseph and his brothers, and also perhaps between Joseph and himself in the process of what's happening in his engagement with his brothers. As we're reading through the portion this evening, I noticed that in the Hebrew, the, the word that's used for recognize, as in Joseph recognized his brothers, is the same uh, basic Hebrew word as used for in that same verse where it says, Joseph made himself strange to his brothers. So there's, there's a relationship between recognition and estrangement. It, it, it is almost as if in order to get to know oneself better, one needs to estrange oneself from what one has so far been living with or accustomed to, or perhaps to take from Wallace Stevens' poem, one needs to get to estrange oneself from the plain sense of meaning in, in order to recover something richer and deeper, mm -hmm. both within oneself and in one's relationship with the other. And perhaps he's also... Uh, you know, what, to 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 give a, a more contemporary play on the notion, 
Perhaps in a, in a way, Joseph is also playing the role of a therapist in a way. He, he's going to disorient, he's going to disrupt uh, his brother's per perceptions or assumptions about who is who and, and what the relationships are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in the course of that, perhaps uh, it, will, it will cause them to come to know themselves, not only him, but to know themselves in a different way. And perhaps that's what's what we'll uncover in next week's Torah portion as well. So thank you for bringing up all, all those dynamics that are happening in that scene. Let me call upon uh, Anna and then Dave. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, I found it interesting that the Ephraim and Manasseh mentioned as his sons born to the Egyptian wife. He lost his mother on the road, right? She died on the road. And He's on the road on the way to Egypt, and that's where he gets a wife. Mm -hmm. And also, we say the blessing on Shabbat may, uh, over our children, our sons, may you be like Ephraim, Manasseh. And we're saying, uh, you have a Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother, and may you be blessed. So the, the, whole, the whole entrance of patrilineal descent coming into play there and being so uh, completely part of the story and part of our continuing blessing um, fascinates me. That is fascinating. Thank you, Anna, for bringing that up. So yes, when, in Friday nights, when uh, parents bless uh, the children, when they say a blessing over the boys, they say, may you be like Eph Ephraim and Menasha. And the question is, why Why be like them? Why, why choose the, the two tribal heads that who were born in exile rather than one of the uh, sons that were born in the land of Canaan. And so one take on that it might be that if one can endure with a sense of integrity as to one's identity in exile, uh, that takes great character, great endurance, and, and great encouragement. So maybe be like that person who's able to retain even during all this disruption, your sense of location and orientation in the world. Uh, let me call upon Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, I started uh, pondering over the word uh, dream. And uh, I got to think there's one kind of dream that you dream when you go to bed at night and sleep. And uh, that could be almost anything. It's very unlikely. It's something that goes on in your head. And it's probably not very real. The second type of a dream, I think the idea would more or less be an idea mm. where, and this is what I think Martin Luther King says, I have an idea, but he calls it a dream because it's very unlikely. So, like I say, I, th I think you can bear down into the word dream and get a number of different meanings and ideas. Uh, from this one word. So thank you. So you're you're drawing this distinction between something that is unconscious, yes, uh, as opposed to uh, I've thought about this, and and this is this is the new possibility that I have consciously constructed, if you will, and oh. and drawing that that distinction. So I would just suggest uh, either either one, uh, although there's a different level of cognition, perhaps active cognition, perhaps that either one uh, demonstrates some level of capacity to, to uh, imagine a possibility that doesn't, con bad, that doesn't uh, currently exist. So would be a good uh, word for Ethics of uh, uh, Hi, Marty, you're on. Uh, you're... Oh, I, but I'm sorry. Yeah, Mom! So, <laughs> Uh, l let me uh, call upon uh, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thanks. I I love studying dreams uh, and and thinking about dreams in terms of the Jungian analytic tradition. And the process in dreams seems to be that there's. Two, I mean, one easy way of thinking about it is that dreams you want to dream and dream. You want to dream them through again and again. Nightmares you want to wake up from, 
It's interesting that, I mean, Joseph, at the beginning of the stories of Joseph, at the, at the after what, after, after uh, Jacob settles, right? and then Joseph, the story, but, but um, he has the dream and then he wakes up from the dream and then it's a nightmare. His brothers do all this horrible, I mean, that's all of that that he needs to wake up from. The dreams are mostly things that are you, I mean, again, when Martin Luther King's talking about it, it's like, of course you want to dream that again every day. So just kind of an interesting distinction. So, yeah, so the distinction between uh, a nightmare, which becomes a, a basic trope in horror movies, right? The notion of a nightmare uh, or a dream, uh, which is often portrayed in movies as something that's uh, a fantasy, uh, unattainable, right? And and here in in Torah, what's happening is that these dreams become uh, visions of what's possible. And when one has the that one has the capacity, as Joseph does, and as the as a most skilled character that we've seen in this regard to turn dreams into reality. Uh, and so I think this uh, much of this Torah portion for me goes back to this book ending of these two poems, uh, the first by Wallace Stevens, which begins, which raises the notion of if all that we are living with is the apparent plain sense of things, that which is unadorned by layers, text, textuality, uh, color, covering even, uh, that if that's what we're left with, then we're left with no imagination and we go from uh, the barrenness of the end of fall into the cold chill of winter. Uh, and I'll, I'll just acknowledge that in our Hebrew calendar, you know, we have just started the month of Tevet, uh, which was preceded by the month of Kislev, which is where we begin the celebration of Hanukkah. And that month is preceded by the month of Heshvan. And Heshvan is the only month in the Jewish calendar that has no holiday and, and uh, no special mitzvot to, to perform. And sometimes it's often called Mar Heshvan, meaning bitter Heshvan, because it's absent of any color, celebration, and, and we move out of that month into the month of Kislev, which is this month where we celebrate light and miracle and revival uh, of spirit and nation. And so I, I want to uh, acknowledge that Wallace Stevens reminds us of what, what things could be like if all we're left with is the barrenness of plain sense of things. And then end with our poem by James Weldon Johnson and our painting uh, by Aaron Douglas, who remind us that uh, when we reach those points of crisis uh, and fissure and fracture, uh, that it's not only despair that we can uh, respond with, it's also uplift and even renaissance and new hope. And I want to thank each and every one of you for, uh, oh, let me call him so, so sorry. I didn't see you, Mark. Please share with us, Mark. Yeah. Um, Rabbi, you tied everything together so beautifully. I'm not sure I can add anything to what you just stated, but um, I was just fascinated with the play of the words shever and sever and how those two words seem to be a recurrent theme throughout the, the Torah portion. Um, you know, obviously with the um, idea of there being a famine and then there being plenty in the beginning, but then the shever and the sever between the brokenness uh, of Joseph and his brothers. And then as we'll find out later, the opportunity for them to reunite. Um, I just think it's fascinating how Hebrew sometimes can uh, offer us an opportunity to explore different meanings without having to have an answer yeah. to give us the power to imagine um, whatever we want it to be. And it changes from year to year.
Well, that's all I have to say. And well, it's sure. beautiful. And, uh, you know, just the fact that when one looks at the Torah scroll, there's the Torah scroll doesn't direct us as to how to pronounce those three letters uh, in this particular context. Uh, it's as if it says to us, okay, what, what do you think? How do you want to articulate them? Yeah. yeah. This invitation to participate in the final design, or not final, but to participate in the design of this overall picture, this overall story that we're being presented with, uh, is so empowering. And uh, I, I, again, want to thank each and every one of you for, for being the artist that you are, uh, bringing your explorations and your contributions to meaning uh, to our time together and to the world around you. Thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to our uh, regathering and our next time. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, turn it and turn it again for everything that's 